All right, let's go ahead and get started this evening, and we will get ready to march through the Bible again this Sunday. Thank you all for being here. Everybody's had a great Sunday. We'll be in Exodus chapter 32 if you're joining us online. Thank you for being here. Hit the share button on Facebook. Tell us about YouTube. I mean, we're excited about this is a, uh, a very well-known chapter of Exodus as we talk about the golden calf this evening, uh, but we will... We will walk through this and and break it down and go through some things piece by piece, but do plan on covering the the whole chapter 32 today. So let's recap real quick uh, what happened last week in Exodus. We did two chapters last week, Exodus 30 and 31, and we really finished up the the furniture and and I would say design of the tabernacle, and then we talked about... Um, those that were selected to start building the tabernacle. But in chapter 30, we read about the altar of incense. So that's the place where the priest sits inside the holy place, if you remember. Um, when you go into uh, the tent of meeting, you have the holy place and the most holy place. But inside the holy place there, we had already discussed the, um, the golden lampstand and the table of showbread, uh, the table of the bread of presents. And then we learned about last week the altar of incense. So the priests were instructed as they serviced the lampstand both morning and night, they were also to keep incense burning. And it's representative, we looked in a couple places in the Bible, but it's representative of the prayers of the people. Revelation called it the prayers of the saints that went up. So we we saw that there in the holy place. Then Moses is commanded in chapter 30 to take a census of the people. And again, that we... As we went through that, we talked about kings take censuses of their kingdom to show uh, two things. One, it showed that that they were under someone. They were more or less owned by someone, so they were owned by the Lord. And then also there was a a tax to be paid, and it was half a shekel, and this was for their atonement of their lives. So everybody paid uh, 20 and over, paid a half shekel for their atonement to show there was a price to be paid again, and we linked that back and forth. Um, So Moses did that in chapter 30. Then we talked about the bronze laver. It was constructed for the priests to wash themselves clean before they offered, not after they offered, but before they offered sacrifices and other types of offerings. And so again, think think about this, that they needed to be washed clean before they did the service of the Lord. They they did their worship and their service as the priests. Then the Lord gave instruction for the anointing oil, which is applied to everything at the tabernacle, including the furniture and utensils. This oil was a very specific blend. It had the, the frankincense and the cinnamon, all those things that went to it. Um, there was a specific uh, measurement of uh, the hen of oil and all these things. And so th- that went together. They anointed the, uh, the tabernacle with it, and it became holy. It became set apart um, for use by the Lord. And the oil, that the, the Bible said there in Exodus 30 to Moses, that if they used the oil, whoever had mixed it or people around it, if they used the oil for anything else, that they would be cut off from the people, that it was a specific anointing oil and it was to be used for a specific purpose. Then in chapter 31, which is a smaller chapter, we talked about the builders of the tabernacle that were selected by God, kind of the project managers of it. We read that Bezalel was the first person in the Bible that we read about that was filled with the Spirit of God and how that was a, a really a unique situation. It was a unique revelation for us because we see of all the people that we've read about so far in the Bible from Genesis 1 to Exodus 31 of all the patriarchs of Adam, of Eve, of Noah, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes, Joseph, we named all those folks. But the Lord chose to fill Bezalel with his spirit, the one that was chosen to oversee the construction of the tabernacle. So really, we talked about what that meant. That meant that you were able to do and say exactly as what God wanted done and said when you filled the Holy Spirit. So we know, as New Testament believers, as a Spirit-filled church, that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we let the Spirit operate within us, that we are operating in the perfect will of God. As, As we speak from the Spirit, we're speaking what God wants spoken. As we work in the Spirit, we're doing things that God wants to be done. So that's That's an amazing thing, and that's why we, uh, as believers, should seek the Spirit, and we should seek the gifts of the Spirit, and and let the allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in our lives, make sure that our flesh is out of the way. And the last thing in chapter 31, God reminded Israel to remember and keep the Sabbath day as a sign of the covenant He made with them. So we briefly mentioned that the, uh, the covenant with Noah had the rainbow as a sign, The Abrahamic covenant had circumcision given as a sign, and now we see at Mount Sinai that the covenant, the sign of the covenant was this keeping of the Sabbath 
And that was a day that was set aside, no ordinary work to be done, that they would worship the Lord, they would, uh, they would read the scriptures as, as um, Bible history would play out, they would read the scriptures even today. And really today, uh, the Sabbath day, um, Shabbat, is a very family-oriented day that is taken together in, in communion with your family and friends. Um, kind of what we would, I guess, sometimes we take little family trips to like Gatlinburg, right? It's a quick getaway. That's how they would treat it. I know we were in Israel for the Sabbath. There was, um, we were there for one Sabbath, and that was the hotel that we went to in above Jerusalem. And, and there were a lot of families that just checked in for the day or for the night and the weekend, and they had big dinners, they were singing, they had all their family there, children, you name it. So it's a unique experience to see, and something that even we, I think, still do today is uh, in our church and our culture is we have a lot of family dinners on Sundays and things after church, um, after we get done with church. So again, some things, some, things, some traditions, although they may look a little bit different, are still at their heart, you see, that are translated over from those Jewish roots to where we are today. So that's what we talked about in chapter 30 and 31. So let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and we will start in chapter 32 with the molten calf, the golden calf that was created. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this evening to gather in your house. Lord, we thank you for the day we've had uh, as a church family, worshiping you, Lord, and hearing from you, Lord. Now just be with, be with us as we study your word, as we do every Sunday together. Lord, speak to us in a mighty way. Father, just we want to learn more about you. We want to learn what to do. We want to learn not, what not to do. But we want our hearts to be after yours. So, Lord, just speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, really, this is a fun chapter in a way. Uh, and not in, a, in, in other ways, it's not a fun chapter because there's some bad things that happen. But we'll see the faithfulness of God. We'll see the long-suffering of God. We'll see what happens at Mount Sinai, and we'll tie it back to the New Testament um, in Acts as well. So let's begin here in chapter 32. We know that Moses is still on Mount Sinai. He's been up there, you know, receiving the commandments from the Lord. He's been, the tablets have been written. We read that at the end of last week, how that the Lord had written on the, uh, the tablets of stone with his finger, the commandments. And so we open up in chapter 32, and verse 1 says, we're in, I'm sorry, we're in lesson 29, by the way, of Exodus, and lesson 80 overall. But verse 1 of chapter 32 says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, now I'm not going to talk about this right now, but it just hit me as I was reading that. Uh, and it's something different in Acts. But one of the unique things that I like about the book of Acts when I read when Peter's preaching there after the day of Pentecost he often says, this Jesus, that they crucified, this Jesus, and to the Jewish people. So when I read that, this, the people are saying, this Moses, right? Like he's just some ordinary guy, some ordinary dude that's like, you know, just there with him. So in the New Testament, we see the same thing. They're like, this Jesus. And so the Jewish people that gave Jesus up to be, to be uh, crucified, to him, he was just some, you know, false prophet, false teacher. And so the people of Israel here, because we know Moses was a type and shadow of Christ, they're saying, this Moses, right? So that just literally just hit me. Um, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. That's all he did, right? Like if you, like he's just some guy. This man, he brought you up out of the land of Egypt with the help of the Lord, of course. Uh, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were, that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and, and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, a couple of things I want to say about this as we go. Many folks believe the Israelites were trying to serve a new God. That they had just turned away from, from Yahweh and they were going back to this Egyptian idolatry they were at, this serving these, these false gods. They were trying to become a a polytheistic, right, multiple gods uh, nation. But what we see in the original text, and it's not translated the best here, even in the ESV, is that this word here translated for gods, probably it's Elohim, which can be plural or singular. It's, a, it's just a generic term for God. Um, a lot of times we'll call our God, and the Hebrew, the Jewish God, will call it, be called Elohim, but it can be with a little e, kind of like we would say God with a big G versus God with a little g. 
but anyway, if you look at the way it's translated with the verbs that are around it, it should be a singular God, not God's. So we could say that it's, um, the, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So Israel is not trying to serve, as we look at the text, a new God, a different God. But the problem is that they chose to break the command by wanting to worship a graven image, right? They, they're struggling with the fact that when they were in Egypt and they saw the Egyptians serving those, those false idols, those graven images, that they want to serve a God they can look at, right? God told them, don't, don't make a graven image of me. That was one of the Ten Commandments spoken, that he spoke at Mount Sinai. But they wanted, their flesh was, was so strong, they wanted to see the God they worship, right? And, and even we in this church time that we live in today, Sometimes struggle with that, worshiping an invisible God. But, but they wanted to, to see the God they were worshiping. <clears throat> so that was the command they broke. Not they were going after a new God, but they were wanting to see the one and make a graven image. Aaron, the brother of Moses, the one that was set over the people, right? He's the, we know he'll become the high priest. Um, he, it says that, uh, that he, he listened to the people, right? The people said, up, oh, make for us gods. And he was just like, okay. Sure, whatever you want, right? He, was, he didn't want to upset the apple cart. He was afraid to stand firm in the truth that he knew and the command that he was not given just by the Lord but by Moses um, to not do this, to, to just keep watch and to be more or less the judge over the people while he was gone. So he demands the people take the gold off their body and give it to him to make this golden calf. Now think about they've already given contribution, the half shekel. They've already you know, given all this stuff for the, the service of the tabernacle. And so we, we see, or will, and we see that here they give away their gold, which is probably their most precious, valuable things, the, the metal gold is. But what we see is that most Bible scholars will say that the calf wasn't even made of, of solid gold. It wasn't like there was, you know, a thousand pounds of gold melted. I don't know what it was. But anyway, like a solid chunk of gold formed into a calf. What, we, what they think is that there was a wooden calf made, like there would be in Egypt, and it was kind of covered in gold. So it was like a, just gold-plated. Does that make? I don't know if that makes sense or not, but um, not less valuable, I guess. But a gold-plated, it was basically a cheap Egyptian knockoff. All right, let's just put it that way. Um, is what Aaron had fashioned here for the people to say. And so he made it. He grave. He made it with a graving tool. Made the golden calf, and they said, "These are your gods, O Israel. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt." So they're wanting to see and worship. This image of the Lord. The Bible goes on in chapter five, or verse 5 and says, When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. Now, now they we're taking this a little bit further, right? We had this graven image, and now we're going to build an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. See, this kind of this kind of concretes the idea that they were trying to serve the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they just wanted that image. So Aaron says, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Now, I didn't talk about this morning in my message, but you see the tie here where there's these offerings given before uh, Leviticus. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay, so we have them. Aaron makes the calf. He builds an altar. And he says, tomorrow <clears throat> shall be a feast to the Lord. The people are going to bring offerings to it. They're worshiping it, and they're going to rise up to play. This type of worship that they were doing would have been well known to the, uh, to the people of Israel because of what they saw in Egypt, but also to those, the pagan nations. This worship was meant to appeal to the senses of the worshiper. And again, we talked about that a little bit this morning in our message, but it's not meant to be pleasing to the Lord. It wasn't about the God that they were worshiping. It was about them pleasing themselves. When they rose up to play, when they were eating and drinking, it was all about them. Okay, that, I would call this worldly worship. We see this today. We see this happening when you, when you see the evil of the world get together, and it's not a good, it's a very carnal experience. Okay, I'll just leave it at that to make it somewhat G-rated, I guess. But it's a carnal experience. It's a very sensual appeal to the world, but it was blasphemous to the Lord. It was all about them. Okay, it's, I, mean, I don't know if it was like Woodstock in whatever year that was, but let's just call it Woodstock, all right, for, for lack, because I'm not that old. But anyway, um, that's what we'll say it was like. But it was blasphemous, uh, blasphemy to the Lord. That's what they're doing. Verse 7 says, and this is all happening down at the bottom of Mount Sinai, 
Meanwhile, Moses is up at the top with the Lord. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. So we know the Lord is aware of, right, everything. He's all-knowing. He is, uh, he, he's all-knowing, all ever-present, all-powerful. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So obviously, again, if you didn't know it beforehand or you didn't believe it, the Lord is able to see and hear what the people are saying and doing while he was there with Moses. Again, something that we can't do, but the Lord transcends time and space, okay? Um, but we see that he says, he repeats exactly what they did, as we read just a few verses before. And the Lord said this, um, he said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. The word here used for corrupted, which was in verse, let me, where did it go here? Third line, there we go. Yeah, the, the, uh, corrupted themselves, sorry, thank you. Verse 7, the same word used for corrupted is the same word that's used during the time of Noah for the people and how they were, were wicked, right? Remember the Lord said that he's, he's looked everywhere and there's, everybody's wicked, they're waxing worse and worse. The same verb is used here. For the people of Israel, God's chosen people, and the way they're acting around this golden calf. So it's not just like they had a little mistake in judgment. It's not like they said, man, we, we just kind of slipped up. It was just like a, you know, just a little something. No, they have turned away completely. The Lord says they have failed to walk in the way that I commanded them. They have broken my commands. So not keeping the law, not keeping the commands of the Lord is sin, right? Can we just say that? Can we just... The Bible says in the New Testament that lawlessness is sin. So a disregard of the law, dis, disobeying the commands, you know, being willfully counter to God is sin. And that's what we see here. And so we, I mentioned this this morning, but we see the word here used. This is the first time that we've read it. But he says that Israel is a stiff-necked people. Now we'll see this used. It kind of becomes the, the common theme and common word used for Israel throughout the Old Testament but this word stiff neck gives us, us a picture of a horse that will not change direction when the reins are pulled. So we, we know that if you've ever ridden horses or if you've ever seen it or whatever, the, the rider of the horse, when it has the ability to steer that horse with the way the reins are pulled or to slow it down or to, or to give it some so it goes faster. And so when we say stiff neck people, it has that picture of a horse that when the reins are pulled, it is not going to obey the rider. Right, because we know that the horse, is, although a much larger animal than the rider is, a person is under the control of the rider typically. But when they don't obey, as I said this morning, they get whipped. Right? That's how that happens. That's things, there's a punishment for not obeying when the reins are pulled a certain way. So we see here that they are a stiff-necked people. The Lord will use this word over and over again in the Old Testament. We read it in Jeremiah this morning, I think Jeremiah 7. Um, so again, we see this kind of become their, their kind of second name. Um, a stiff-necked people. But the Lord's anger has kindled, and he's going to wipe this nation off the face of the earth and make Moses a great nation. He says, I'm going to consume them so that I can make you a great nation, Moses. He's basically going to have Moses become the next Abraham, right? Because he promised Abraham in Genesis 12 that he would make a great nation of him. He says, look, these people have... And think about how serious of a, an offense this is. That they have turned away from me completely. I'm going to wipe them out. And I'm going to start over with you, Moses. That's, that's not something to be taken lightly. That's not something that's just like, oh man, look, you know, God's mad. No, he was ready to wipe them out. Just to destroy them. To so think about when we break the commands of Jesus. Break, and I know we're under the law, we're under grace, and I get all that. But through Jesus we obey the commands. But when Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commands. When we don't keep his commands, think about the hurt that it causes the Lord. Think about how serious that is. We, we can write sin off sometimes as just being nothing. We can just make it, just let it roll off our backs like water off a duck's back, right? That's how we act sometimes. But we see the Lord takes it very serious. What happens next is one of the most amazing things in the Old Testament that we read. In verse 11, Moses responds, because Moses could have right here, 
said, all right, Lord, let's do it. Make me a great nation. He could have said, I've been up here with you, and we've been having a great time. We've been fellowshipping. You've been giving me these commands, this law. You've given me all these instructions for the tabernacle. Those, you know, those people down there, they've turned away from you. I'm not like them. Use me and make a great nation. But Moses does the opposite. Moses, it says, implored the Lord with his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent that he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. The King James right there would say repent. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, not Jacob, but Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self. Right? The Bible says he swore by himself because there's no one greater he could swear by. That was in Genesis 15. He says to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. In all this land that I promised I will give you to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented, repented in King James, from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Wow. Talk about an amazing encounter by Moses. When Moses could have been so selfish... And justified, though, right? He would have been justified in saying, God, use me to make a great nation because I have not disobeyed. But Moses shows his true heart. He says, no, Lord, don't do it. He says, calm down. He said, don't forget your promises. He says, remember, don't give the Egyptians a reason to say, look what their God did. He said, remember what you told Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He said, remember the, the promises that you spoke back then. Do all these things. The land you promised to give Abram and his descendants, he says, don't. And we read the Lord relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. Now Moses cried out and interceded. Right? We, we know that Moses is a great intercessor. But he reminded the Lord of his promises. Now that's something that we can do as believers. We have the power and the authority to remind the Lord of his promises. Isn't that amazing? So, and, it's, and really, it's more for us than it is for the Lord, right? The Lord hasn't forgotten. The Lord didn't forget what he told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But sometimes when we're going through things, we need to remind the Lord of his promises. We can speak back the word of God to the Lord. It doesn't offend him. It doesn't make him mad. It's a gift he's given us as believers. So we can go back. I've done it before. I have quoted scripture back to God. And somehow it made me draw closer to him. Right? It's an amazing thing that happens that sometimes I can't even explain why it does, but I just know that the Moses gave us the type and the, and the uh, ability, uh, showed us how to do it, and we can do it ourselves. But Moses cried out. He interceded for the people of God. He reminded the Lord of his promises and what he had done. Verse 14 says he relented or he repented in the King James. And when we talk about God repenting, because we'll see it a few other times in the Bible, it's not as in human terms. It's not like God said, I've sinned. And I need forgiveness. That's not what we're talking about. No, he, he relates back to his people of creation. God sees that his creation has gone off course. There's a fallen nature. He's remembering that, that what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. And he's going to act in a way that will show his mercy and grace. That's how when God repents, is that he remembers. It's an intentional remembering. Do you ever have, to, ever have to do that sometimes, that you get so angry, you have to remind yourself of how much you love your wife and things and some stuff, right? She's, I know she's had to do that with me too, so I can say that. How much you love your kids, how much you love your neighbor, right? how much you love all... And sometimes you have to do that, right? That you've got to take a step back, cool off for a second, and say, I can't, listen, I love these people too much. I can't do this. I'm not acting in a rational way. Now, the Lord doesn't act the way we act, but that's kind of how I'm trying to explain it in our terms. Okay, so there, that's what we're talking about. There's three things that have to happen to occur when the Lord repents in the Bible, or, or he relents or repents. One, there's an the intercession, which Moses showed us here. Next, there's a repentance of the people. Now, they have sinned, and they need forgiveness. And the third thing we'll see is the compassion of the Lord come into play. Those are the things that will occur when we read about the repenting of, of the Father. We'll see intercession, we'll see repentance of the people, and we'll see the Lord's compassion come to play. Next, after the Lord has relented, Moses goes down to confront the nation of Israel. Now, Moses, man, he is hot, okay? 
Like he is mad. He is, I can't say I blame him, but he is on a mission to go off Mount Sinai and to see what's going on because the Lord has told him, and I can just see him like just stomping down that mountain, you know, like probably saying some things under his breath and just getting ready. Uh, you know, he's not going to spare the rod, okay? Let's just put it that way. And so we read in verse 15, Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written, The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. I mean, like, if if you're Moses and you have these tablets of stone that have been inked with the finger of God and you've got your people down there just doing something dumb, think about how mad you're like, I've got tablets written by the Lord. Like, did, did you not just be like, man, can't you all just see what's going on? So he goes down and he's there and Joshua, we know that Joshua was there halfway up the mountain with him. He heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said to Moses, there's a noise of war coming in the camp, or in the camp. Joshua heard this this noise from down to the bottom of the mountain, and he thought, it has to be war. There has to be someone come against the nation of Israel, against our camp. They're trying to destroy us. So I hear war down there. Joshua, he's so pure in heart. But Moses said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory, or the sound of cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. The sound of singing. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. Now we read about the Lord's anger burning hot, but now Moses' anger burned hot. How many know that we cannot control our anger like the Lord controls his anger? Right? So sometimes we struggle with that, okay? It says that he threw the tablets out of his hands. Has anybody ever thrown anything and they get mad before? I may have. I ain't going to talk about anything. I, Nikki's giving me that look because she knows I can expose her on a few things. But I love her, so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to talk about what I've seen come flying by my face. But he burned hot. He threw the tablets out of his hand. He broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, and he burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Man, that's tough, isn't it? Like, I just, like, in my mind, this is like a cartoon playing out or something, like a Looney Tunes episode. I don't know if you all, like, I'm just seeing, like, steam coming out. He, he gets that, like, he just builds a fire real quick, throws the calf on it, has, like, a, a hammer or a rock, just beating it to death and burnt, and just making it powder. He gets the, the water, throws it on there, and makes them drink it. Here, you want to worship this calf so much, drink it, right? This, this is what you get. It goes back to what we said this morning, though, about when the Lord said, give your offerings to your governor, and he also said in Jeremiah, I think it was where we read in Jeremiah, he said, you take your offering and eat it yourself, right, if it's acceptable. So this is what, the, this is what Moses did here. Moses, he, he lost his cool. He did all this. He made him drink it. And really for him, when Moses made him drink it, it was for humiliation. Right? It, was to make, it was to make a show of the people for what they did. This is not the first time we'll read this. Actually, we'll see in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 20, he feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. He cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Right? So we see this humiliation or this uh, derogatoriness of this he feeds on ashes is what we see here. Moses in 2 Kings 23, um, I think it's, oh, I can't remember if it's Joash or Josiah off the top of my head. Um, it says, moreover the, moreover the altar of Bethel, of Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that altar with the high place he pulled down and burned, reducing it to dust, and he also burned the Asherah. So we see this, the people of God, I think it was Josiah for some reason in my mind, I apologize, um, I slip in my memory. But when they go in and they correct the sin of the nation of Israel, they pull it down, they burn up what's of the falseness, right? The false worship, the false idols, and they make it to dust. I mean, there's, they destroy it completely. And that's what we see happen here in these two places in the Old Testament. Verse 21 of chapter 32, Moses said to Aaron, now listen, this is where it gets real. He said, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, all right, there's that this Moses again. The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So he's repeating what they said. So I said to them, let anyone who have... Uh, who have gold, take it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Like, that sounds like your kid when you're getting, they get in trouble. 
Like, I don't know what happened. We were just there, and I, I threw the stuff in the fire, and then poof, here come a calf. Like, you know they're busted, okay? It's just, it, it, it seems comical, right? Like, Aaron's just repeating it, and it almost seems like what Eve and Adam said to the Lord when they were called out for their sin. They started saying the serpent came and said this and did this. Well, I, I, sort, of, I sort of feel that same theme happening here. But they, he, Aaron says, it was their fault, their evil. I made them give me their gold. They gave it to me. I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Like, the fire birthed this calf. And if you're Moses, you're probably thinking, dude, really? Like, that doesn't even sound believable, right? So Moses called Aaron out. And Aaron, his response is that of all failed leaders. Because Aaron was in, was in charge while Moses was gone. They always blame someone else. Accountability is always a problem when people are exposed. It would have been the right thing for Aaron to say, you know what, I failed. It's on me. I should not have listened to the people. Even if their hearts are evil, I was in a position I know better. I serve the Lord. I've been with Moses. I've seen what God's done. I should have held the standard. Sometimes we have to do that, right? Sometimes we have to take our lickings. Sometimes we have to just, it is what it is, be accountable for our actions. But there's more respect and accountability than there is trying to dodge it or put it off on someone else. So Aaron did that, which all failed leaders do, and he, he blamed someone else. Verse 25, the Bible says, When Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. So Moses said, All right, we'll just figure out who's, who's really left in this camp that's going to serve the Lord. Now think about how many people are in the camp of Israel, right? We talked about possibly a million or so that came out of Egypt. And he says, he says, who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. Right? This is where we get the Levitical priests. And he said to them, thus says the Lord of God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you. Go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. Verse 29 says, Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord. Ordained for the service of the Lord. That's the priestly service, right? Today you have been chosen as the priest of the tabernacle for the service of the Lord. Each one of you at the cost of his son and his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. Moses turned his attention to the people, said, whoever's left that serves the Lord, step up. You would think a lot of people would have ran. But only the tribe of Levi, the sons of Levi, did that. Then they, they were told to take their sword and kill their own. Go throughout the camp. Kill those that participated in the false worship. Those that were led astray. Those that were, that were caught up in this. Those that were guilty by association. You've been guilty by association. Hang out with the wrong crowd. Get caught up some things that you didn't mean to get caught up in. It's a legit thing. We see it here in the Bible. So the sons of Levi, they, they break away from this pagan worship and they're ordained for the service of the Lord. Each one of them at the cost of his son and his brother. 3,000 people were killed because Israel worshipped a graven image. They wanted to worship the Lord, but in their way, not God's way. The way that we worship the Lord matters. We've been given instruction. It can't look like the way the world worships God. It can't be the same way the pagans do it. It can't be the same way that the evil folks do it. Those that are serving the Lord, those that have been saved, those that are they're called by God, that we can be called children of God, we listen to the commandments of our Father. 3,000 people. Fast forward a couple thousand years to the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost. Now we know that the day of Pentecost, the festival of Pentecost, the, uh, in the Hebrew Shavuot, it's a celebration of the law given at Mount Sinai. We've talked about it a few times in our study. As we, um, as we went through, it's, um, it's right after Passover. It's the next feast. It's the Count the Omer, 50 days past, right? So we looked at Jesus when he was crucified, resurrected. We know that he came uh, uh, 50 days after his resurrection. There was the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2 at the upper room. Those that tarried, those that waited, 
Right? These people did not wait. They turned away to their own lusts. They did not wait on Moses to come down. Those did not wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit or for Jesus as Jesus promised them to tarry there. Did not receive the Holy Spirit. But we read on the day of Pentecost that Peter began preaching. And I'm going to read you a little bit of it. It does have it in here about when he says this Jesus, right? So we talked about this Moses. But Acts chapter 2, and we'll start reading in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, right? They said, this Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. Peter says, this Jesus, whom you've crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They realized what they had done. The people of it, the, the Jewish people, the people in Jerusalem, they knew what they had done when Peter says, you crucified the one that the scriptures have prophesied about, the Messiah, Jesus. You crucified him. And so it cut him to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 40, And with many words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those that received... His words were baptized, and they were added that day about how many souls? 3,000. Wow. Could it be that God's a restorer of the nation of Israel? That 3,000 that lost their life at the day when they worshipped the golden calf when Moses came down, that 3,000 souls were, were killed by the sons of Levi for their false worship, for their, for even though they were just maybe guilty by association, they were led astray. But on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached the gospel, it says that day added about 3,000 souls. Don't you love the completeness of God? Don't you love how he, listen, he's got this thing worked out, the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, everything in the middle, in between. Nothing gets by. It's all perfect. It's all complete. I mean, it just, God, that gets me excited right there. That makes me want to just, just jump and shout that he restored that which was taken away. God is a restorer. At the end of chapter 32, we're going to read this and we'll close, we'll close here just in a minute. Verse 30, it says, The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. This is the heart of Moses. He's their intercessor. He's the one that cries out to God, but now he wants to be their savior. He wants to be the one that pays. He wants to be their atonement. He says, you've sinned a great sin, but maybe I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold, but now if you will forgive their sin, he says, God, if you can, forgive them. But if not, blot me out of your book that you have written. He said, he said take me Remove me, God. I will stand and pay the price of the, for their, punish, or their punishment for their sin. Put it on me. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the, then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf. The one that Aaron made. Moses loved the people of Israel so much. Even though they were evil at times. Even though they fell off the horse and the wagon at times. Even though they made mistakes. Even though they wanted to stone him when they came out of Egypt. Because they were hungry and thirsty. He said, God, I'll give my life for him. That's a type and shadow of Jesus, right? God said, no. He said, every man will have to stand for his own sin will be held accountable. But we know through Jesus, right, that perfect atonement's been given. Think about how much or how many times we have given Jesus a reason not to love us, that we have been like the people of Israel were to Moses, that we've been mad, that we've fussed, we've cried, we've, we've made our golden calves, we've done all these things, we've worshipped the wrong ways, we have, we have gone astray. But still, he gave his life for us. 
It's an amazing, it's a love that we can't describe. It's a love that we can't put into words. But that's how much that Jesus loved us. That's how much that the Lord loved us, God the Father loved us, that he gave his only son, that it was already in motion before the foundations of this world were ever put in place, that when we fail, that Jesus would be the perfect lamb given for our atonement. Now I'll just say this as we close. The plague was sent for the disobedience. Sometimes we get disciplined by the Lord. In today's world, that's not thought of highly. It's not welcome. We live in a time where it's basically they want it to be illegal to discipline your children. Now, we don't want to hurt our children. We don't want to do, go too far. But we are called to discipline, right? We are called to show them the way. Discipline is love. It was because of love that God put Adam outside the garden of Eve and guarded it with the flaming sword in the chair. Because if they went in, they would have eaten the tree of life and never died. Right? They, would have, they would have done counter to what God, so God did it out of love. So at times we have to be disciplined. The Bible says that God disciplines us as a father does his children. It's out of love. It's for our correction. It's not for punishment. It's for our correction. All right, let's close it there. Any questions or discussion tonight? Easy ones, that is. Easy ones. Anything got anything? We've got a few minutes for the ladies for getting their prayer tonight. Yeah. Idols again, that's true. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's a, re- it's a process, a, re- a repetitive process that the nation of Israel does. Yeah, that's true. Good deal. Anybody else? Anything? Okay. Yeah, well, probably that, and they were holy. They were they were exalted in the in the sight as well. So you had a natural and a figurative high place. So that makes sense. But yeah, they would put them up higher. Think about Jerusalem. It's up on a, you know, it's 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 elevated up, right? So they would call that a high place as well. Like the temple was a high place. Yep. Because the same thing happened with. Uh, Judges Gideon, right? He had to tear down the altar of Baal and the high places and, and the Asherah that his father had built. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it goes like that. And the scary thing is it's called uh, religious synchronism. And so you take things that are man-made religion, but you try to make it look like the Lord, like, like legit relationship. So they, you know, so they brought those aspects of God to it, the offerings, the peace offerings, the burnt offerings, all that. So they took that paganism and tried to marry it, right? And it's, that's the scary part. Right, but we look at the church today as a whole, right, the church of Jesus Christ as a whole, and what do we see in some places? We see that religious synchronism going on. Take things of the world, try to marry it to the things of God. Jesus said you can't serve two masters, right? You either love the one, hate the other, or hate one, love the other. So yeah, I agree, it goes fast, but to me that, that's what scares me of it is we pass it off as, as worshiping the Lord. Yeah. And to those that aren't trained, if you don't, if you don't read the word, you're easily, as 3,000 were caught up. It, yeah. Anybody else? That's a good point, though. I like it. Nothing? Anything in the back row back there? I won't tell any stories on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. You can see there that restraint that had grown. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, he buried him in the sand, right? We read he, he, he killed the Egyptian and 
It's when the Hebrews said, who made you our judge? Yep. Good deal. I like it. And to me, one of the, ma the most amazing things today is that, that day of Pentecost. And you, I love when I see the New Testament just complete the Old Testament out like that. And it just it, it blows my mind. We see that perfection. No, he just folded. Yep. Yep. He did. And unfortunately, we see that, again, it's, that's, times haven't changed sometimes. Um, you know, it's hard to, to hold firm the faith and, st and be the standard. It, the thing about the, na the nation of Israel against one man, that, that'd be hard to stand when you got all that pressure of all those people. Because he had, he had seen what they did to Moses, how they wanted to kill him. But yeah, he, he did not push back at all. He just kind of followed orders, I guess. It's like the tail was wagging the dog. I'm sorry? Forty, yep. It could be, yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's, to maybe add to that is they never developed their own personal relationship with the Lord, right? If they would have sought the Lord daily then maybe they would have had that relationship that would have said, hey, you know what? We were told to wait. We'll wait. Because we know how hard it is to wait. One of the most difficult things is getting a, uh, a promise from God, but he rarely gives you the time. All right, that's where the faith comes in. You've got to have faith to believe that it'll pass, that, it'll, that what he said will come, come to fruition. That's the hardest part. That I, I call it the in-between not a fun place to be in. You gotta have faith. Good discussion. All right. Last call. All hearts and minds clear. All right, let's dismiss in a word of prayer and we'll have the ladies stay and us men folk will get out. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for your long suffering. Lord, we thank you that we can remind you of your promises to us. We thank you that you have. Uh, we have an intercessor like Israel had Moses, that we have Jesus, that he sit at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us. And we thank you for that, that he gave his life for us, that he was that perfect atonement. Lord, so we just want to be, we, we want to learn tonight from your word, as you, as you tell us that it's given for our instruction, our reproof. Lord, just l let, us, let our spirit learn, not just us from, a, from a, a natural knowledge, but a spiritual knowledge. Let it be in there. Let it, let it be ingrained inside of our spirit, Lord, so that whenever we're tempted to turn away, whenever we're tempted to do something that's false worship or whatever it may be against your commands, against your will, that, that our spirit is checked by the Holy Spirit, that we have that check in us, that we stop, that we can repent, we can back up, and we keep our eyes turned to you always. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. And come back Wednesday if you want to hear part two of Drawing Near. Tomorrow, celebrate recovery. And other than that, have a great rest of your Sunday and blessed Monday.